Ugh, it's Sophia again. She sent me a PDF. What is that? That's violence. That's what it is. Hello and welcome to Arts24, where we're taking a tour of treats for your ears and eyes this week. First, its majestic dome is a curvilinear flourish on the Paris skyline. Soon, visitors will be able to enjoy the Grand Palais's elegant architecture and spacious interior as it reopens after three years of repairs and refurbishments, just in time to host some important events this summer. Shona Bhattacharya reports. The Grand Palais is undergoing a renaissance thanks to the 1,200 workers on site. After three years of painstaking construction and repair, it'll be transformed into an Olympic hall. These 17,500 square meters of glass will cover fencing and Taekwondo events. The audience will enter through here. You can't imagine it the way it is now. We will be ready. The audience will discover what gives Paris its charm. In three months, the entrance is expected to look like this, a refreshed look for this 100-year-old palace that was built for the 1900 World Fair, a place that has seen its share of grand events. Shows, horse races, and more recently, colossal museum exhibitions and even fashion shows. Its latest reinvention as a host site of the Olympics necessitated redoing the floors, the balconies, and repairing the Beaux-Arts mosaics, a 500 million euro renovation project. If we, if we hadn't done these works, we wouldn't even have been able to enter the Grand Palais. The stairs were no longer up to modern standards. We will have 43 elevators instead of the two we had before. Some windows are 17 meters high, so it's really a monument that's larger than life. Here's a sneak peek at the layout for the games. In the nave, a fencing strip will be laid out on the ground with on either side bleachers that can accommodate more than 7,000 people. At the far end, two staircases that the athletes will use to enter the hall before the bouts. The Taekwondo events that come later will need a large mat. During the Paralympic Games, the same competitions will be held here as well. Time is running out for the artisans to complete their work, like restoring this clock from 1855. We'll have to get the dial up and running again. That will give the time all over the Grand Palais. It's an important task to symbolize the end of the restoration works on the building and also be ready for the games. The main hall will be ready in time, but the entire building, all 72,000 square meters of it, will reopen to the public in the spring of 2025. Next to a warm-hearted TV show that's made the most of Maya Rudolph's comic ta talents to deliver a biting commentary on the lifestyle choices of the super-rich. Apple TV's Loot is back for a second season, and our TV series reviewer, Diptyka Laurent, got a chance to chat with the show's eclectic cast. Take a look. Bonjour, comment ça va? Ça va bien? Oh, I love it. Ça va bien, merci. German Pell Nat. Don't worry about it. Today we meet the cast of Loot. They're behind a quirky bunch of co-workers who run the charity foundation of Molly Wells. Maya Rudolph plays the former tech mogul wife turned $87 billion divorcee. I want you to get everyone into the conference room for a, you know, like a group talk session, like... Are you trying to say the word meeting? Yes, that's it. That's the word. The second season is all about Molly taking control of... Okay, no, I no longer want to feel broken down. I no longer want to be the victim of my experience. I want to embrace this thing that I've started, and she's she's taking a lot of pride in um, the Wells Foundation. We, ridiculously wealthy people, are the problem. Starting today, I'm going to give away all my money, all 120 billion. She's also um, decided that she's on her own wellness journey. So um, I thought th that was a really fun place to explore. There's so much 
wellness to explore and so many different versions of it going on in the world and there's no end to new ideas so that was really fun but also this kind of this fun um sort of uh swearing off relationships element to it too which is part of the wellness which i think plays a fun fun role place your hand on each other's hearts oh boy Lutz co-creators, this season was also about leaning into their actors and incorporating parts of their lives into the characters. Oh, hey Molly, did you have any thoughts on the PDF I sent you? I refuse to learn what that is. Michaela J is like nothing like Sophia Salinas, but we did want to put a little bit of Michaela into Sophia this season, so that's why you see her sing some Whitney Houston. You see a little bit about her love life, because in person, Michaela J is super vibrant and charismatic and warm, and Sophia is the opposite of that. So let's bring a little bit of Michaela J into that. You know? Michaela J. Rodriguez plays Sophia, the straight-laced, socially awkward woman who runs Molly's foundation. It's a far cry from the actress's role in the series Pose, for which she became the first first transgender woman to win a Golden Globe in 2022. Cheers. How important is it for you uh, and other transgender actors to be able to embody non-transgender roles? I think the main focus for me was to not make it either a biological or trans thing, but more so encompass it as a thing for just women in general um, and make a even playing space for all women. Uh, and it just so happens that I'm a trans woman playing a cis role. I hope that younger girls around the world, no matter if they're trans or not, can look to my character if they know or if they don't and say, I want to be like her. I want to strive to be like her. I want to have the tenacity that she has. I want to have the grit that she has. I want to have the no nonsense, you know, no take any BS that she has, because I think every woman should have that. The show, above all, is about comedy and farce and capitalizes on the cast's excellent chemistry, like between Molly and her assistant, Nicholas, played by Joel Kim Booster. Here we have a folic acid kale smoothie. Mmm, what flavor is this? Gin. That's it. That's what I'm tasting. Were there any moments from this season that you really loved shooting or episodes? Or were there any really fun moments? It's really fun when we get to fight um, yeah. in the show because yeah. it, it like never lasts very long, but it is always like so goofy to see these characters that love each other so much like just like go at it a little bit. It's, it's yeah, and I think it's really their their most intimate. You know, that's the uh, that's the way they express a, an element of their love too, because they don't they don't sleep together. Mm -mm. <laughs> We need to talk about this broken yogurt machine. We don't have a yogurt machine. OK, then whatever machine I've been putting Greek yogurt into is not operating properly. <laughs> Well, it's gone down as a 70s pop classic. Waterloo was ABBA's breakthrough hit thanks to the Eurovision Song Contest 50 years ago. The group won Sweden its first prize at the competition. And as for their musical careers, the rest is history. Andrew Hillier takes a look back at five decades of ABBA. Fifty years since the ABBA frenzy began, there's no sign of it stopping. In London's Waterloo station, a flash mob brought the transport hub to a standstill as they celebrated the transformation of a French military feat into a Swedish musical triumph. And just 20 minutes from Brussels, on the grounds of the Battle of Waterloo itself, an exhibition is revealing the entire ABBA saga in the city that inspired the Eurovision winner five decades ago. Waterloo, I was defeated, you won the war. Waterloo. Promise to life if I wanted to. I saw them perform and they immediately stole my heart. Immediately, in an instant. And they always have been my favourites since then. In 1973, the band was rejected from the Eurovision auditions with a song in Swedish. It was still early days for the quartet. The following year, though, they came back with a vengeance. With puffed up hair and glitter, they shook up the competition and clinched the title. 
In just 2 minutes 50, ABBA went from shadow to spotlight. It was a whirlwind that overturned all the clichés of the contest. They came in with completely outrageous outfits and a rock style. The rest, as they say, is history. They became disco royalty, churning out hit after hit. In 1982, the group split up and no longer made the headlines. But in the 2000s, Abba Mania was revived thanks to a new movie and a musical dedicated to the quartet. The four singers still knew how to thrill, with groundbreaking concerts starring their very own holograms. Another hit with the fans. Well, speaking of the Eurovision Song Contest, this year pop star Slimane will be the French entrant on the big night in Sweden on May 11th. His track Mon Amour has already topped the charts here in France, so it looks like the odds are in his favour and the pressure's on since the last time Eurovision crowned a French winner was in 1977. We'll leave you with a clip of that track, Mon Amour. Otherwise, do check in with us on Arts24 next time on our social media too. Otherwise, there's more news coming up just after this. Sure.